All right, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to the organizers for putting together uh, a really nice workshop. I've had a lot of fun here um, uh, learning about something that I don't do, microlensing. Uh, so now I get to tell you something about something most of you don't do, which is transiting uh, planets. Uh, uh, and so um, it's Friday, it's the last day. We haven't had the morning coffee break. Uh, so I'm gonna start with some words that no one wants to hear. Uh, <laughs> Um, and specifically, um, you know, you've heard a lot about microlensing this week. Uh, many of you are very experienced in microlensing. Uh, and so you know what you get out of a microlensing light curve. Uh, but uh, I want to know, what don't you get? Uh, what are things that you wish you could get from microlensing that you don't know? And remember, it's audience participation. <laughs> so, yeah. The radius, that's a, that's a great one. I'd love to know about radii. Anything else? Yeah. Phase curves, that sounds great. Anyone else? Yeah. Compositions. Um, anyone else? Kaylin, you look like you might have something you want to say. No, I was just worried because it's going to go on for a while. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, th those are all totally reasonable. Uh, and so I brainstormed before this, and I came up with a couple. Uh, some that you guys said, some that you didn't say. Uh, radius is kind of the most obvious one, given the fact that I'm talking about transits here. Uh, anything about the atmospheres of the planet, perhaps. Uh, orbital resonances, uh, rings. Uh, and I was convinced on Wednesday night at dinner that maybe you could learn something about rings uh, someday with microlensing. But you don't have any yet, so I'm keeping it on there for now. Um, Planet star misalignment, uh, like Dan talked about in the previous talk. Uh, inclinations of the planets, uh, oblateness. Uh, there's a whole list of things, as Kaylin suggested, uh, that you might want to know that you don't know about. And many of these you can learn about, albeit for different stars, uh, from planetary transits. Uh, so this brings me to my conclusion slide. Um, <laughs> that uh, there's three things we're going to talk about here. The first, that transiting planets give you information that microlensing doesn't, and we'll have a crash course in transits. Uh, and then specifically, W-first is going to be a transit-finding machine, literally and figuratively. Uh, and I want everyone to pay, oh, that's the wrong, man. This, uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Dan told me I was going to mess it up almost immediately. <laughs> Uh, and this is important, the transiting planets, you should care about them, the ones that W first will find, because they're going to be really important for helping us constrain planet formation. Caitlin's not here, but I'll, I'll continue spreading the word on planet formation. Uh, so let's begin. What is a transit? Many of you know this. Uh, in case you've you know, not been paying attention to the past 10 years with Kepler uh, and the past 10 years from the ground before that, uh, stars have planets. Occasionally, these planets are just uh, perfectly lined up along our line of sights so that they pass between us and their host star. ESO has this really nice video uh, showing this. And so the planet passes in front of the star. Um, we don't resolve the star. We just see uh, one point of light. Uh, but we see the shadow of the, star, of the planet passing across the star, which causes it to appear fainter for a little bit of time and then eventually brighter again. You see that once. Eh, you know, it could be anything. Stars are weird. They do all sorts of strange things. Um, but you see it multiple times, periodically. Uh, this tells you uh, something fundamental about what's going on with the planets. The most obvious thing it tells you is the size of the planets. Uh, so this is that list I brought up earlier. We'll walk through some of these. Uh, the uh, relative, uh, you know, the, the size of the dip that we see, this transit, tells us about the area of the planet relative to the star. Uh, because it's just the shadow of the planet on the star's surface. Uh, and so if you can measure, uh, which button is it? This one. Uh, if you can measure uh, the depth of the transit, which is kind of the most obvious observable, uh, this can tell you something about the radius of the planet, assuming you know the radius of the star. Uh, and so these are tiny. Planets are small, stars are big. Uh, this is uh, a Neptune-sized planet, uh, and Kepler has great precision, so we can see that. Uh, Somewhere on here, uh, there's a little dot right here. Uh, if this whole slide is the size of uh, a star, this dot is the size uh, of the sun specifically, that dot is the size of the Earth. Uh, and so you know, the area, 
the, that dad is covering is the area that the Earth covers as it crosses the sun. It's about 80 parts per million, or on this axis, 13 pixels. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to find when we try to find an Earth. Uh, so it's a challenging uh, 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 project to do. You need really high photometric precision. Uh, the next thing you get from transits are information about the atmospheres. Uh, and so um, uh, I've got a picture here uh, that I took from uh, the NASA website of a planet. It's really from NASA. Uh, and so imagine this planet uh, has an atmosphere. It uh, looks something like this. And just for the sake of oxygen, it's, uh, for the sake of argument, it's just made of one element. It's pure oxygen, uh, you know, really easy to understand. Uh, oxygen has very specific uh, wavelengths at which um, it absorbs light uh, and other wavelengths that it does not. Uh, and so as this planet crosses in front of a star, that took about half an hour for me to figure out how to do. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, uh, the, the star's light passes through on the way to us. Uh, and so uh, at wavelengths where oxygen is absorbed, this whole surface uh, uh, appears as the transit. Uh, and when oxygen gets straight through, uh, you know, light, uh, we have to watch it again. OK, yeah. Uh, now it's only 15 minutes per. Uh, and so in this shell, uh, uh, at wavelengths where oxygen uh, uh, is transparent, then the planet appears smaller. And so if you look at the size of the planet uh, as a function of wavelength uh, that you're observing, uh, you know, a perfect rock would be the same at all wavelengths. A strong atmosphere is different at different wavelengths. And so then you can tell things about what's in uh, the atmosphere. This is uh, a simulation of what uh, Saturn would look like. And so you can see in the infrared, you work out you know, methane and acetylene and hydrocarbons and other things that astrochemists tell, you, tell us exist. Um, but then you can actually make pretty strong inferences about the atmospheres. Um, orbital resonances are cool. Uh, and this is an important one. Uh, so remember this one for later on in the talk. Uh, occasionally, uh, stars have multiple planets. Uh, and so as these planets pass each other in their orbits, uh, they exchange energy and angular momentum. Uh, so you know, two planets going around, one gets sped up, one slows down. Uh, and that causes the transits of the one that was sped up to appear earlier and the one that was slowed down to appear later. So instead of this perfectly periodic behavior, uh, we start seeing uh, what we call transit timing variations. Uh, and so here's an example of just you know, phase folding a bunch of transits on uh, a perfectly periodic uh, grid. So each row is a different transit. Uh, and you can see that some are earlier and later and earlier and later and earlier. Uh, and so this isn't a big effect except when planets are near resonance. And so these perturbations are happening at the same spots in every orbit. It's like pushing the kid on the swing uh, that they build up. Uh, and so you can actually infer the presence of non-transiting planets and measure the masses of these planets uh, and just confirm that they're planets in general. Uh, uh, so uh, orbital resonances are really nice for helping us understand planets and for confirming them. Uh, rings, I gave microlensing a hard time for not finding any rings. We haven't found any either. Uh, we have a candidate, though. Uh, this is a paper that just came out a couple weeks ago uh, with this uh, kind of funny looking transit where it comes in very quickly and then very slowly leaves transit. And the hypothesis is that it looks something like this a planet with a ring around it. It's kind of obvious how a ring appears in a transit, right? It's, it blocks light. Um, but if the ring is inclined like this, then you know, it very quickly enters the transit and slowly leaves, so you get this non-perfectly U-shaped transit. Uh, planet star spin orbit misalignment, uh, Dan talked about recently, so I won't talk about it more, except that I get to show this again. Um, so uh, I, there's, Dan talked about one way to find it. Uh, another way is that uh, stars have spots. And so as this uh, planet passes across a spot, the spot is cooler. So it gives off less light than the star as a whole. So as the planet crosses the spot, uh, it appears uh, the transit has a little bump in it. It appears brighter for a little bit. Uh, it looks something like this. And so you can see here, this is uh, the planet crossing a spot. 
Uh, and so each time the planet transits, uh, if everything's perfectly aligned, you might expect it to cross the same spots. This planet doesn't ever cross the same spots, so we know that the spots are changing where they are in the star relative to the planet, so it must be uh, misaligned between the planet's orbit and the spin axis. Uh, and then finally, inclinations. Um, you know, when we have multiple transiting planets, sometimes they pass on top of each other. Uh, and so we see a bump in the same way, like this. And so then we know that these planets must be orbiting in exactly the same plane. Uh, so that's our uh, transits in 13 minutes. I uh, hope you learned something. Uh, and hope you're really excited about finding transiting planets uh, and uh, you know, understanding their architectures. Uh, uh, there's three things to know, to, to remember from this. The first is that transits are rare. Uh, you know, not all stars have planets. Many of them do. Uh, but we need this perfect alignment to measure a transit. Uh, and so uh, that perfect alignment is rare. Uh, if you kind of put the solar system somewhere else and just put it in some random orientation, there's only about a 1 in 200 chance you'd see the Earth transit. So you need to look at a whole bunch of stars uh, in order to detect some transits. Uh, so transit surveys need a lot of stars. Uh, Kepler observed a couple hundred thousand stars uh, over its four-year lifetime. Uh, the second is that transits are uncommon, which sounds like the same thing, but isn't. Uh, transits, you only detect a transit when the planet is perfectly along your line of sight. Uh, the planet spends most of its orbits not along your line of sight. Again, if we were far away looking at the Earth transit, uh, we, the transit would take about 13 hours uh, once per year. So that means it spends 364 and a half days not transiting. Uh, and so when we look at a Kepler light curve, this is a hot Jupiter. It's a planet really close to its host star. Uh, and you can see all of the transits. You can pick them out really easily. But you can see that the vast majority of data is taken not during a transit. Uh, and you're seeing star spots. This is an M dwarf. Uh, it's got giant spots on it. Uh, and so uh, you need to look at a lot of stars, and you need to look at them regularly. You can't just take one observation. You need continuous monitoring in order to find these transits. Uh, and then the third point is that transits are small. Here's that point again. Uh, so you need high photometric precision. Uh, in order to detect transits. Uh, Kepler had all three of these things. Lots of stars, long time baseline, high photometric precision. That's why it was a great success. Uh, this figure makes it look easy to find the, the transits. Uh, it's not quite that easy, but Kepler makes it feel that easy. Uh, another telescope that has all three of those is W first. Photometric precision, time baseline, um, uh, lots of stars. Those are the three things you need for microlensing. So it's you know, very synergistic in terms of building a mission. Uh, and when you build a really nice microlensing mission, you accidentally build a really nice transit mission as well. Uh, and so let's, let's compare these here uh, in terms of these three parameters. Uh, photometric precision. Uh, we can look at the, the actual noise properties of the stars in Kepler compared to the predicted noise properties of the stars in W first. <laughs> I'll plot those on the same graph here. Uh, so the blue dots are points observed by Kepler. Uh, this CDPP uh, is uh, a value that the Kepler team uses uh, to mean noise, uh, just kind of the time average noise over six hours. And so it's a nice metric here because Kepler uh, and W first have different integration times. So it puts them on the same scale. Uh, but you can see that uh, you know, the predicted noise uh, uh, the predicted noise uh, for W first with two different prescriptions, depending on what you want to believe, uh, is kind of in line with Kepler for the bright stars uh, and extrapolates favorably. You know, if we take Kepler and keep on going, W first has much you know, better photometric precision around the very faint stars. Stars are fainter for W first than Kepler. Uh, and so, you know, in general, Kepler is more precise, uh, so we'll give it the check mark. But W first still has the precision to find planets. Uh, we can uh, test this by just taking stars with the noise that we see in W first, or that we expect to see, uh, and building fake planets around them. Uh, so uh, we know what transits look like. Uh, we can put a planet around a star. 
uh, you know, observe it with W first, add noise like we expect W first to have, and see if we can tease it out. Uh, so let's look at the best possible case. Uh, a giant planet around a fairly bright star observed with W first. Uh, here it is. This is a 15th magnitude uh, star. Uh, so kind of at the W first uh, saturation, saturation limit. Uh, a hot Jupiter around the sun. Uh, or, um, uh, yeah, I think it's a three day period, uh, this button. Uh, and you can pick it out easily and just in a single transit. You see it uh, right away. And then in a full season of observing, uh, 72 days, it's extremely obvious. And it's extremely, extremely obvious in the full you know, six campaigns uh, of W first. Uh, and so, yes, W first is still uh, has the precision to find planets. Uh, and we can extend this out. You know, what if you don't care about Jupiters? What if you care about uh, you know, smaller planets, longer periods? Um, yes. Uh, and you can see that it really can detect um, uh, lots of planets. Uh, so around a fairly bright star, and then a, a more typical star, maybe even on the fainter end for W first. Uh, around bright stars, it's really complete. You know, any planet that transits bigger than Neptune with a period less than 40 days or so, uh, it's complete. Uh, and this falls off only because we require two transits to be uh, detected in a single season, in a single campaign. Uh, you know, for Earth radii, I dropped off an axis, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Earth radii. So this is Neptune size, this is Jupiter, this is Earth. Uh, so around a fairly bright star, you know, we're complete. We find Neptunes, we find things that are on the rocky, gaseous boundary. You know, in Earth-sized planets in very short periods, occasionally we can even find those. Uh, at longer periods, you know, this is the so-called habitable zone for an M dwarf. You know, Neptunes are easy, Earth, or twice Earth is kind of at the limits. Um, but those are still, there's a lot of planets there. Uh, and for a fairly faint star, you know, things fall off, but Neptunes, Jupiters, you're still totally uh, bang on. You can totally do that. So I gave Kepler a check mark, but we're going to give W first a smiley face anyway. Uh, next is the observing baseline. Uh, there are different strategies. Kepler observed one field for four years. Uh, w first will observe for 72 days at a time. Uh, but this uh, six campaigns, assuming there will be six campaigns, are spread out over five years. And so it's a longer baseline. Uh, if you care about dynamical effects, that's helpful. Uh, so they both get a check mark. Uh, and then uh, the number of stars. Uh, Kepler had about four and a half million stars in its field of view, of which uh, about 200,000 are good uh, targets. Uh, w first uh, has this really nice large field of view towards the bulge uh, where there's a lot of stars. Uh, and so there's, uh, Matthew Penny has some simulations that we used uh, that have about 300 million stars in the field of view, of which 20 million are decent targets to find transiting planets around. Uh, so that gets three check marks. That's, that's just <laughs> incredible to me. Uh, so you know, Kepler was designed to be a transit finding mission, and it did that really well. W first was not designed to be a transit finding mission, but it's still going to do that really well. Uh, and so just the numbers are 20 million stars is a factor of 100 more than Kepler had. Uh, and so, uh, oh, which button? This one. Uh, hot Jupiters uh, and even intermediate temperature Jupiters, uh, W first is complete to. So for every hot Jupiter in Kepler, we might expect W first to find 100 of them. You know, any one weird oddball you see in Kepler, W first will find 100 of assuming it's a giant thing in a fairly short period orbit. So, you know, that's, you see, I, I have to sit down when I hear that. That just, you know, changes the game entirely. A uh, hundred times the yield for some of these giant short period things. Uh, and so, what does that mean in terms of absolute numbers? Uh, if we take stars that are brighter than 21st magnitude, uh, uh, using Matthew Penny's predicted what the W first field is going to look like and brightnesses of all the stars, uh, we can see that uh, you know there's about 20 million stars in there, uh, as up to a little more than 20 million. And if we assume that planet occurrence is the same as the Kepler fields, uh, inject planets, try to observe them, see if we can detect them, uh, you find 50,000, 60,000 planets, uh, primarily uh, you know, giant planets around F and G stars. 
Uh, but the, the numbers are very large. Uh, and then uh, if we say that, OK, well, we know that the Kepler field has these planets. Uh, but locally, we know that there are more planets than there are in the Kepler fields, uh, giant planets specifically. And we think this might have something to do with metallicity, that metal-rich planets more often form stars. Towards the bulge, uh, stars get very metal-rich. And so if we extrapolate that metallicity uh, dependence on giant planets all the way up to the W first metallicities uh, and repeat this exercise, uh, the numbers go up even more. And now we have more than 100,000 planets. Uh, and this is assuming the W first mission as you know, in the SDT report from a couple years ago. So 10 fields, um, you know, six observations, uh, any changes that would affect these. Uh, but this, this is 20 times what Kepler found. Uh, and so, so, so what? Uh, we, you know, we can find a lot of planets, uh, but you know, they're going to be around faint stars. Uh, we've heard, you know, H23, who cares? We can't follow them up. Um, uh, you know, why do we care about having 100,000 planets? Uh, well, first is that we don't need to follow them up from the ground because we can understand them from W first alone. Uh, uh, one of the ways that we can confirm these planets uh, is by looking for a secondary eclipse, so when the planet goes behind the star. Uh, that's hard with Kepler. We've only done that in kind of the best cases because planets are faint. Stars are bright. Uh, you know, the, the actual brightness from a planet is not that high relative to the star uh, in the Kepler bandpass, which is in the optical. W first observes in the near infrared where planets are much brighter. Uh, and so we can do the same exercise and see if we can find secondary eclipses for these giant planets. Uh, and it turns out in a lot of cases we can. They're hard to see in a single transit here or a single eclipse. But by the end of the mission, you can tell there's something going on here. Uh, and so a secondary eclipse gives you information about the atmosphere of the planet. It tells you how hot it is. Uh, the position of the secondary tells you something about the eccentricity, how circular the orbit is, which tells you about how the planet formed uh, and how it evolved to get to where it is. Uh, and so, you know, we, we can do the same tests. How many secondary eclipses can we find? And it turns out it's a few thousand, uh, which is way more than we know of right now. And these are primarily around uh, G and K stars. Uh, for the F stars, uh, the planet, uh, or the star is so bright it overwhelms the planet signal. Uh, for the M stars, uh, the, the planet gets cooled off fairly quickly, and so we can't see anything there. Uh, we can also find dynamically interacting planets with W first. Uh, again, we talked about transit timing variations earlier. Uh, if we put uh, systems like that we see in Kepler with fairly large transit timing signals uh, and try to observe them, the W first baseline is so long uh, that the signals become uh, you know, pr pretty observable. Uh, and so, you know, if these systems, if these planets were not interacting, uh, each x corresponds to a transit of one planet here. Uh, the red points are the actual transits as observed by W first, uh, and with uncertainties similar to what we might expect to see for a single transit. Uh, you know, it's not linear at pretty high confidence. If, these, if this was a single planet, no interactions, it'd be a perfectly straight line. You know, we can rule out that these are on a straight line uh, with pretty high confidence. So we know that these are actually planets. Uh, and uh, in the best cases with Kepler, we can measure their masses. That's a little trickier with W first because we have these long gaps where interesting physics is going on. These curves represent physics. Uh, so it's hard to prove what the physics is, uh, what the masses and eccentricities are. Uh, but it's easy to say that these are definitely planets. Uh, so we have a bunch of planets. We can say that they're definitely planets. You might still be saying, so what? Why do we care about, you know, we, we understand half Jupiters. Why do we care about having a few more of them? Uh, well, you should care about having a few more of them uh, because these planets are fundamentally different than the hot Jupiters we know about right now. You know, we know about planets from RV surveys, which are uh, basically uh, targeting stars within about 100 parsec, maybe a little more, but not a lot more. Uh, and from Kepler, uh, and now K2, which looks out to maybe a kiloparsec out, uh, but that's not a very big region. Uh, relative to the size of the galaxy. Uh, even over this fairly small region, we see differences. Uh, there are more giant planets found uh, locally by RV surveys than Kepler is finding. Uh, and so it's not quite clear what's going on there. Maybe it's the effects of binaries in some way. Maybe it's a metallicity effect. 
uh, you know, there's a few different arguments that you know, the, the story hasn't quite fully been solved yet. Uh, but even over a kiloparsec, it's different. Uh, and so when we move to several kiloparsec away, uh, let's look at what the, the W first planets look like here. Uh, the, uh, you know, pick your favorite plots here of you know, occurrence like the Kepler field or locally, uh, or scaled based off metallicity. The planets are, like Dan was showing, at seven, eight kiloparsec. Uh, especially, you know, even the ones around M dwarfs are at two and six kiloparsec. Uh, and the ones around K dwarfs are at five kiloparsec. Um, so these are formed in a fundamentally different environment than the ones locally. Um, you know, the, the fields are metal rich, so probably you're more likely to form giant planets. Uh, so you're more likely to have perturbations. Maybe you can form hot Jupiters more easily. Uh, maybe this will pump up the eccentricity more. So these hot Jupiters more often have, uh, you know, large eccentricities that we can find in the secondary eclipses. Uh, you know, Looking at these planets, seeing uh, where they exist, around what kinds of stars, uh, what are their eccentricities, uh, you know, how, how hot are they, uh, are going to tell us about uh, the formation and evolution of these planets uh, and how it's different than the Kepler field and how it's different from radial velocity land, which is nearby. Uh, and so uh, this will tell us then something uh, uh, you know, that we don't understand about planet formation right now and really help us solve uh, the question of how hot Jupiters uh, get to be where they are. We know they don't form there. Do they evolve gracefully in disks or through some kind of really messy dynamical interaction? We don't know. W first is going to go a long way to tell us that. Um, and so just to put that in you know, a very simple phrase, W first is probing a new galactic environment, one that we don't have right now. Uh, and one that we don't really have a good opportunity to get to uh, uh, otherwise. So, you know, the microlensing is really important because it's telling us about planets in wide orbits that we don't really have a good handle on. Uh, w first is telling us about planets in short orbits that we know about locally, but we don't know how they change across the galaxy. W first tells us. Uh, and then Gaia will fit in there as well. Uh, and so just, you know, these are some of the questions that, that we'll answer. Um, uh, uh, how do giant planets form and evolve around the most metal rich stars? That, that's what I just talked about. Uh, do our expectations from locally, uh, you know, what we think we know about planet formation, is that true when we're halfway across the galaxy uh, in you know, a crowded area, uh, in a metal rich area? We'll, we'll learn. Uh, are the planetary atmospheres different? Uh, we'll know about many more atmospheres from W first than we do from anywhere else. Uh, what about the eccentricities? Are TTVs common, transit timing variations? This will tell us, are multiple planet systems common? Uh, so these are really uh, fundamental questions that, that we think we know locally, but you know, people will debate. Uh, and this is going to just open up a totally new region where we can start answering these questions. Uh, so you're welcome to come uh, work on transiting planets with W first with me. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, and so uh, to put up my conclusion slide again, uh, the transiting planets, uh, you know, we took a crash course. We learned a lot about what we can learn from transits, uh, things we want to know about these systems. Uh, we saw that W first will be a transit finding machine, literally and figuratively, going to use the same joke. Uh, and that these transiting planets are going to be really important for helping us constrain planet formation, planet evolution. Uh, so thanks for listening. Now we can have coffee. Yeah, that, that, that's a really important question. Um, you know, the vast majority of these, um, uh, even with a 30 meter telescope, are going to be really hard to follow up to get information on. Uh, and so. Um, uh, you know, we showed that several thousand of them uh, will be confirmable with W first, which is, you know, it's a large number, but it's still a few percent of the W first systems. Uh, and so for the rest, we want to do uh, maybe not confirming, but validating, which means something different in the transit community. Uh, so some sort of statistical tests to show that with a high degree of confidence, we believe these are planets. Uh, and so uh, the the biggest astrophysical issues are uh, you know, background eclipsing binaries, uh, you know, other things, other astrophysical events that happen to fall in your field of view, 
uh, that uh, you know, maybe are on a background star um, that, that cause you, you, you see the light from two stars and you get confused on what's going on from one star and the other. Uh, and so uh, the W first field has many more stars, uh, but the pixel scale is much smaller. Uh, and so uh, it turns out, it works out that stellar density per pixel is almost the same as the Kepler field. Uh, and so uh, it seems that you know, we think the false positive rate will be broadly similar to Kepler from that, and a lot of the tools like Vespa uh, will be directly applicable. Uh, it'll be a little different because um, uh, you know, we, we can't use things like adaptive optics uh, to, to go out and you know, exactly know what's going on behind the stars. Uh, but in a broad sense, uh, I think things like Vespa are going to be the way to go. And for many of these, we will be able to do some sort of statistical validation. Yeah, uh, so um, let me start with your comments uh, on, on the metallicity. So, so everything we used was from uh, Matthew's uh, simulations. Uh, and uh, his uh, you know, came with metallicity. Uh, I, don't, I don't know where you drew the metallicities from. From the Byzantine model. Uh, uh, and so um, those actually showed that the, the median metallicity was plus 0.3 for our target stars. So, you know, at the level which you believe the models, maybe, maybe not. Uh, and so I'll let you and Jennifer. Okay. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm, in a sense, this will help us test that, yeah, if, if we see three times as many planets, they're probably metal rich. If we don't, probably not. Uh, single transit events. Um, I, I do think, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting uh, in that, um, uh, you know, it, it might be probing a similar population for microlensing. Of course, we are looking at the source stars, uh, and you're looking at the lens stars in the middle, so it gets tricky. Um, but I, I do think there's an opportunity there. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the tools for uh, really understanding these single transit events deeply are going to come from tests. Uh, and so um, uh, we didn't talk about them a lot in this paper. We, everything that all the numbers uh, we have there to consider a detection, uh, we required it to be detected. We required two transits in at least one season. So by definition, nothing could have more in the 71-day period. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, th there's certainly synergies there. Um, uh, and uh, it would be you know, uh, something that, that would be fun to explore, but we haven't explored it in any way. All right. 